This year has certainly given me a lot to reflect on. And in that reflection, I've come to realize the things that are truly, truly important to me. And this channel has always been one of those things, ever since its inception. And so I chose this story in particular with that in mind, considering that, if you don't know, this very story is why we are all sitting here today. Jeff the Killer was the very first story, creepypasta story, that I ever heard. I had the coincidence of hearing it through a retelling that was not completely accurate, and so I sought out the original, and that is why we are all sitting here right now reading uh, an entire list of these stories for the ninth year in a row. Now, I know I haven't had a countdown for every year, but even from the first year that I did this, I have had more Halloween countdowns than anything else on my channel consistently. And that is why these are so very special to me, and all of you are so very special to me. So thank you all for sticking out this crazy ride we've all been on together. And I look forward to next year where I have something even more special planned for our 10 year October anniversary, you could say. But for now, I want you to enjoy number eight, Jeff the Killer. As you lie down, relax, and go to sleep. <laughs> The day Jeffrey Woods and his family arrived at their new home, the sky was overcast and the weather was muggy. The gray sky seemed to punctuate his mood. Jeff was not thrilled to be here. Their new home was beautiful, though, a true example of his father's newfound success, but still, it wasn't the home he'd known. A week after they'd settled in, Jeff and Lou woke up early. The sky was a crisp and gorgeous blue, and although the Louisiana heat was playing its usual cruel tricks, the brothers decided that a morning bike ride to explore the area would be just the right ticket to combat the slight pangs of homesickness that they'd both been experiencing over the last week. I miss home, Lou blurted out, as Jeff was smearing salsa on the microwave burrito that would serve as his breakfast. Me too, Lou. But I guess this is home now, so we just sort of have to make the most of it. I, I know, but all of our friends and everything, everything is back in New Orleans. Remember that building we'd always sneak up on top of and watch the city lights come on? I, I miss that, Lou responded, sounding down. Yeah, and ZM Video. The owner knew us and would always let us rent R-rated movies without parents. And he'd always hook us up with a free video game rental if we got a few movies too. I miss that too. But we have to... Lou interrupted. I, I know we have to make the most out of this. But still, 
This place just seems so fake, and, and Mom and Dad, they still just treat us like we aren't even here. Yeah, they do. I was sort of hoping the new house would improve that, but what can we do? Lou had no answer. Jeff finished his breakfast, and the two boys left the house to mount their bikes and explore around a bit more. As it turned out, the subdivision they moved into was rather close to a cluster of stores and a small shopping center. Village Shopping Center was the name of it. Within these were a pizza hut, a Chinese restaurant, a tobacco store, a sprint store, and what Jeff and Lou were most excited about, a video store. We'll have to get mom or dad to come down here and open up an account so we can rent movies, Lou mentioned as Jeff flipped a box over to read the description of a horror movie. Ah, shit. You're right. Jeff snapped, feeling a bit of frustration at the thought. He knew getting his parents to actually come down here and set up a membership would take forever, since their usual after-work routine was to go off into separate rooms until they got hungry enough to come out and speak to each other. Jeff glanced over at the girl working behind the counter. Hey, maybe I can go over there and sweet-talk her into giving us accounts, he joked. Ah, yeah, right, Jeff. One look at you and she'll probably ban us from the store. Lou remarked back, a smile brought on his face. You doubt me, little man? Doubt you? The guy who's kissed two girls and almost touched a tit? Never. Please, go on over and lay on all the charm. <laughs> Whatever. I totally could have banged that girl, but her parents came home and... Last time you told me that story, you said her parents were out of town and her sister came home. Jeff became flustered, and while in the process of trying to make yet another comeback, the girl behind the register removed all doubt by speaking to the boys herself. Hey, aren't those your bikes? The young woman asked, pointing towards the glass window. Jeff and Lou looked over and saw three boys outside, two of which were riding around in circles on the Woods Brothers' bikes. They would spin them around and then jump off, letting the bikes crash onto the pavement, just to stand them up and ride them again. The two boys riding the bikes were both slim in build, while a heavier boy stood on the sidewalk, drinking a Red Bull and watching. Jeff and his brother made their way towards the doors of the video store when the fat kid saw them coming. Jeff couldn't hear what he said to his friends, but he made some sort of gesture while shouting, and the other two boys dumped the bikes where they lay and walked towards the sidewalk, directly towards the two brothers. Those your bikes? One of the boys asked as Jeff and Lou entered the summer heat. Yeah. Why are you riding them? Lou asked sharply. Oh, we just saw them there, man. Relax. Figured someone just left them out here for us. The same boy responded as his two friends joined him on either side. Jeff, determined to make a good start here, tried to change the course of this confrontation. Ah, uh, they're, they're ours. We just moved here about a week ago. We live over on Fairmont Avenue, a few blocks from here. We were just checking out the neighborhood. Jeff hoped that a civil tone could turn things around, but he could tell by the insolent look on the kid's face that this was a difficult gamble. Good for you. You moved somewhere, the fat kid remarked. Oh yeah, Troy, the first boy spoke. They moved into the piece of shit house with the gravel driveway. I was wondering who would move into there. Well, Randy, now we know, the big kid, apparently named Troy, replied. Jeff, still trying to salvage the conversation, tried peaceful banter one more time. Okay, so you're Troy and you're Randy. I'm Jeff and this is my brother Lou. We just moved here from New Orleans. Well, you aren't in New Orleans now, the third boy, who just now decided to speak, remarked. Yeah, and just who the fuck told you that you could talk to us? Randy asked, that insolent, privileged smile never leaving his face. Jeff smiled and responded to Randy, well, I guess I could have called you a fucking asshat, but I figured that I would give you the benefit of the doubt before I did something like that. In that moment, a flare of rage replaced the smirk that had previously rested on Randy's face throughout this entire exchange. The other two boys, Troy and the still unknown third member of his band, seemed to be momentarily struck silent. Perhaps they weren't used to being stood up to. Oh, I'm sorry. Was that language too adult for you? Jeff asked. And you, quiet boy. We know this isn't New Orleans. Jeff stated to the slim kid that it reminded him of his geographical locations. Because if this was New Orleans, 
You three would have already gotten your ass escaped for taking somebody else's things. The slim kid looked back and forth at his two friends. However, Randy, clearly the leader, seemed to know what to say. Keith? You gonna let the little bitch talk to you like that? Jeff knew this part, and while he wanted quite badly to sock Randy and his pals around, a real concern suddenly invaded his mind. If he and Lou got into a fight on their first week in their new neighborhood, their parents would freak. He could practically hear it now. And while things had been far from perfect in their home already, even after the move, there was a peace that had fallen over the family and Jeff, fighting his urges, decided to do his best to keep it that way. Jeff looked over the three, very well-dressed, very privileged-looking suburban kids before them, and dismissed them. You guys are boring. Come on, Lou. Let them continue their playdates without us. Lou laughed at that and followed behind his brother towards the bikes. However, Randy and his little gang of would-be toughs would have none of that. They moved to block Jeff and his brother once again. And just where do you pussies think you're going? Randy asked, shoving Jeff. Jeff could tell that shove had no real conviction. Randy was trying to figure him out, seeing where his buttons were. He'd push harder eventually, but Jeff swallowed the slowly building anger within him once more. Lou took a bit more exception to the shove. Ah, oh, just to your mom's house. You see, my brother and I saved a couple of dollars from doing chores. We hear she doesn't charge much. As the words left Lou's mouth, Randy appeared to only register a small portion of it all. Randy Hayden had grown up in Mandeville. His father was a partner at a local firm that made a lot of money, something else that Jeff would soon come to learn. Randy and his friends, while the same age as Jeff, had grown up in very different circumstances. They were used to being listened to. They were used to being feared. In fact, Randy, the target of the insult, just stood there. It was actually Troy, the fat kid who stepped forward, fist balled, eyes squinted in anger. And just who are you talking to? Troy shouted and took a wild swing at Lou. Lou, who was both in better shape and had sparred with Jeff a time or two during his time spent boxing, was able to avoid the punch, but just barely. Had that been all, it may have once again ended there. Troy was clearly taken by surprise at Lou's speed and actually didn't attempt another a punch, but these were bullies. Kids that ran in a pack for a reason. The skinny one, Keith, stepped around and threw a punch that connected with the left side of Lou's face. Jeff had seen enough. He'd been shocked at how quickly this had evolved into blows, even though he'd expected it from almost the start. When he'd first met Randy and his friends, he'd been curious. From there, he developed an annoyance with them. And slowly that annoyance had evolved into an anger. However, upon seeing Lou punched, seeing the small trickle of blood form on his brother's lower lip, upon seeing the smug look of satisfaction on Keith's face, that anger that Jeff felt suddenly exploded into a rage that he'd never felt before in his life. Jeff Woods did not hesitate. He stepped forward, his feet automatically falling into the correct stance that he'd learned from the boxing classes his father once enrolled him into, and delivered a powerful right hand to Keith's face. The skinny boy had no time to register shock or pain. The punch caught him by surprise, and his knees buckled. Keith went down to the ground in a heap of confusion and dawning fear. Randy, the so-called leader here, was almost too shocked to move. He'd had quite a lot of experience starting fights, but no real-time logged in actually losing them. He'd never felt control of a situation slip. He was used to being in charge. So now, seeing one of his friends go down so quickly and easily left him in a state of shock that he had no idea how to address. Troy, on the other hand, seemed to have a plan. Throw another punch. He moved towards Jeff deceptively faster than his weight would seem to allow and threw two equally fast punches. Jeff, however, had no problem sidestepping both attempts. Troy, seeming lost for actions, actually dropped his arms as if to say, Huh, what do we do now? But Jeff had the answer. He moved in, throwing three hooks to Troy's stomach. The hefty kid's eyes went as wide as pie pans, a fitting analogy, Jeff thought. He staggered back, clutching his throbbing stomach. Jeff wasted no time and stepped in once more, fetching a sharp punch to the kid's jaw, causing Troy to promptly fall on his ass. Jeff was reminded of King Hippo from the punch-out game that he used to play, and he couldn't help but smile. Jeff now turned his focus on Randy. He advanced on the boy, feeling something new forming inside of him. He still felt the anger, the rage, actually, at the antics of these three assholes. They had the nerve 
to not only mess with their bikes, the nerve to insult the two kids that they'd never met before, and of course, the ultimate defense, touching his brother. However, mixed in with the rage was also a sweet, enjoyable pleasure. Not only was he kicking their asses, but he was loving every second of it. It was as though the joy of showing them up was perfectly blending with the rage he felt towards them. Together, it formed into a sadistic, controlled sense of power. That was until Lou stepped in front of him. Jeff, stop! That's enough. Why stop now, Lou? They wanted this. Jeff replied in a flat voice that Lou had never heard come from his brother. She's calling the cops. Look! Lou shouted again, and this time, Jeff came back to reality long enough to listen. He glanced over at the video store clerk and saw her on the phone, talking frantically and pointing towards the parking lot. Suddenly, Jeff's strange, sadistic haze collapsed and he regained his former self. Ah, fuck. Let's go, he stated quickly, and he and Lou mounted their bikes and rode towards the parking lot exit. Hey, ha! You better fucking run! Randy called behind them. Jeff and Lou paid no mind and pedaled away. A few blocks down the street, they dismounted their bikes and began to walk them together. At first, neither brother spoke. Then Lou broke the silence. Jeff, thank you for standing up for me back there. Yeah, those guys are pieces of shit. I had it coming. Jeff replied, looking down at the street as they walked. What? What happened? I've never seen you do anything like that before. Just defending myself, Lou. What was I supposed to do? Let them sit there and beat you up? I bet they go to school with us. I bet we'll see them there. And they won't forget this. Who cares? We didn't ask to move here. We didn't ask for any of this. Mom and Dad just wanted a bigger house in a nicer neighborhood, and we were along for the ride whether we liked it or not. Do you think I give a shit what these rich asshole kids think of us? Jeff stated and went back to looking at his feet. Do you think we'll get in trouble? Lou asked. For what? Defending ourselves? I guess you're right. I mean, they did start it, Lou answered. And to the brothers, the matter was closed. However, things were far from over. They found that the trouble they believed they'd escaped was in fact waiting for them at their front door. Jeff and Lou saw the police cars well before they arrived at their driveway. Two cop cars, both parked in front of their house. Both of them felt their stomachs drop as they well knew why the police were there. The brothers entered the living room to see their parents sitting on the couch, the two cops standing up, leaning on the wall, writing in their notebooks. What did you two do? Sheila practically screamed. Mm. What did you two do? Sheila practically screeched as the two boys entered the house. Lou, younger and less centered than Jeff, began to fall on the defensive. Some kids tried to jump us down by the video store. They were messing with our bikes, and then when we went outside, they got in our faces. That's not the way we heard it. Matt Woods interjected, his voice firm and ripe with anger and dissatisfaction. No, Dad, that's what happened. Jeff began to explain. We were down at Friendly Video, looking around at the store, when these three kids started riding around on our bikes. All we did was walk outside, and the kids started talking trash to us, trying to provoke a fight. And then we tried to leave, and one of them punched Lou. Finally, one of the two cops spoke. His tag read, Williamson. Boys, we have some very serious complaints about the two of you. From what eyewitnesses at the shopping center say, you two started the confrontation with Randy and his friends. Jeff took notice at how familiar the cop's tone was when he said Randy's name. This was a small town, after all, and there was a good chance this cop coached Randy in Little League or drank beers with his father. Hell, it was even possible this cop could be an uncle to one of the bullies. No, sir, Jeff replied. We didn't start it. They did. We just wanted our bikes. We were trying to leave, and they blocked us. Williamson continued, as though he'd heard nothing Jeff said. Several witnesses, including the video store clerk, said that you swung first. They say that the boys were riding your bikes, but let me ask you this. Did you chain your bikes to anything, or did you just leave them outside the store? What does that matter? Lou demanded. 
Well, son, if you just left your bikes lying around in the street, then you can't exactly blame Randy and his friends for riding them, now can you? Now, it'd be different had you secured them somehow, but you just left them there. Mom, Dad, are you really buying this? You know me and Lou don't start fights. When have we ever? These three punks messed with us, and if you can't tell these cops are taking their sides, you need to open your eyes. Jeff knew he was skating on thin ice, but that rage, it demanded some sort of satisfaction. Jeffrey, do not speak about these officers in that tone of voice, and do not speak to us that way either. Now, it's pretty obvious you two aren't happy here, but you miss your old home, but starting fights in the street, that's not going to change anything. Jeff's mother snapped back. Listen, boys, you're lucky. None of the parents want to press charges. This will just be reported as a simple scuffle between teenagers, but be advised, you're both on notice. This is a quiet town, not like New Orleans. We don't tolerate this sort of behavior over here. If you see Randy, Keith, or Troy, I highly suggest you tell them you're sorry. We'll be keeping an eye on both of you, so don't let this happen again. You don't want to have an arrest record, do you? Jeff felt his anger bubble over, and he could not hold his tongue. Hmm. Who's he to you, Officer Williamson? Is Randy your nephew? Is he a friend, son? Maybe you're going to go over and fuck his mom while you're on duty. Which one is it, officer? That's it. Both of you to your rooms. Matt Woods apparently found that he was not a mute after all, as he ordered his sons out of the room. Jeff and Lou walked up the stairs, however they refused to hang their heads in shame or feel any regret. Neither of their parents spoke to them for the rest of that day. Jeff and Lou stayed upstairs, venting their shared frustrations to each other. They'd been screwed over. Even at their young ages, they knew that. They took some solace in the fact that they at least hadn't been arrested or cited, but still, they saw what was really going on here. That cop. He was protecting Randy. Jeff whispered to his younger brother. Yeah, no shit, his brother replied. We have to watch ourselves. We have to take care of each other. You saw it down there. Even our parents don't stand up for us. Yeah, what the hell was up with that? Lou asked. Image. Their fucking image. That's what's up with it. All they care about is fitting in here. They want to make sure they blend in with the rest of the Stepford families. No more fighting. If we see Randy or his two fuckhead friends again, we just walk away, okay? But Jeff, you can kick the shit out of them. Why would we walk away? Because I can't! Kick the shit out of the cops, Lou. Kick, kick the shit out of mom and dad. And that's what would get us. Fucking Randy and his pals are protected here. You and me, we're not. So if we see them, avoid them, okay? Please? Lou nodded. I feel like a bitch doing that. I owe Keith for hitting me. No, you don't. I paid him back for that. And I paid his fat friend, too. I just hope they leave us alone now. Jeff and Lou didn't hear from their parents for the rest of that day. They remained in their rooms late into the night, and finally came down to eat after they were sure that their folks had already gone to bed. Lou said that he felt relieved about that, but Jeff had a sinking feeling that the worst was yet to come. Jeff was correct. The next morning, when the two brothers came downstairs together to eat breakfast, their parents were already sitting at the dining room table, staring at the boys, approving of nothing they saw. Sit down, Matt stated flatly. What's going on? Lou asked. Sit down! Matt stated again, anger dancing on the words. The boys complied without further question. Matt Woods began his diatribe. Whatever that was yesterday? Beating up some kids for touching your bikes? Mouthing off to the police? Disrespecting both me and your mother? That stops today. We didn't beat anyone up for touching our bikes, Jeff blurted. Shut up, Jeff! This is a one-way conversation, if you haven't noticed. His father barked. You know that kid, Randy Hayden? His father's a partner at my firm. Did you know that? Did you even think about that when you were assaulting him over your bike? You just didn't think, did you, Jeff? Sheila added. How could I have known that? Matt continued. Well, I have spent the entire morning talking to his father on the phone. His dad is willing to let it all go, but my god, son, I have to deal with that at work now. Do you have any idea how much damage that this could do to me, to our family? Jeff felt that rage coming back and fought with all his might to keep it stifled. Instead, 
He once more tried to appeal to the two adults' parental side. Mom, look at Lou's face. They split his lip open. Can't you just see that? It's still swollen. Lou turned his head to better showcase the injury. Oh my god, Jeff. So some kid played a little rough with your brother? Is that any reason to fight them? You know, I wanted to make some friends with some of the other families in the neighborhood, but thanks to you, I just don't know. No sooner could Jeff or his brother construct a proper defense than their father began speaking again. And so, your mother and I have talked this through. Since there are only a couple of weeks of summer vacation left, we've decided Lou is going to spend the rest of the season at Aunt Marcy's place. We've already spoken to her, and she's willing to let him come out there and stay. Both Jeff and Lou were floored by this decision. Both boys began to protest at the same time, but they saw the look on their parents' faces. The decision was made. Why can't we just both go then? Jeff asked, a last-ditch effort to at least get away from his parents. Marcy doesn't want both of you there. She says you two are too rambunctious, and frankly, we agree, Sheila answered. And so it was. And so it was. Lou was shuttled off to his aunt's place in Abita Springs, Louisiana, a place even smaller and duller than Mandeville. If one can believe that, that is. Jeff watched his brother leave and then walked back to his bedroom. He felt that rage, however. It began to feel almost pleasant to him. He couldn't explain it. He was furious at this turn of events. His parents had turned their backs on their own children. However, through it all, through it all, felt these new feelings that he was experiencing weren't all terrible. This anger, for example, he could almost taste it. It felt like thick, sweet syrup stirring around in him. Of course, he knew the extra ingredient that would complete the flavor. That satisfying joy he'd felt when he had Randy and his friends on the ropes the day prior that mixed perfectly with the anger to create some intoxicating product that Jeff almost craved now. He fell asleep lying on his bed thinking about that syrup, that thick, viscous. It seemed to work its way into the very fabric of his soul. He wanted it, yet he knew that it was destructive and that nothing good could come from sampling it again. Several days passed and tensions were high between Jeff and his parents. Without Lou around, there was nothing for him to do except sit in his room and play video games. He went outside but didn't venture far from home. He knew if Randy and his goons showed up again, it would likely result in another fight. For a few days, that worked well, and Jeff believed he could get through this. However, his mother changed all of that on an early Saturday morning. Jeff was awoken suddenly by sharp sunlight striking his face. He heard his mother humming, something that she rarely did. Even in his half-sleeping state, he knew that humming was forced. She was doing it to wake him up, and figured the added sunlight would get things there even faster. When she noticed Jeff's eyes cracking open, she sauntered over to his bed and began speaking in a tone that simply oozed false jovialty. At first, Jeff had refused. Could his mother really be serious? Did she really expect him to go over and make friends with Randy? He was still in bed when his mother stopped her incessant humming long enough to tell him to get up and get dressed. Once he learned why, he told her no. No way in hell. However, his mother was a shrewd manipulator and she'd know exactly what would get the job done. She promised Jeff that if he did this for her, went over and made it work with Randy, that Lou could come home the next day. She'd sandbag Jeff right into the corner with that one. He'd no choice but to agree. A short time later, Jeff and his mother were pulling into Randy's driveway. Randy's mother answered the door. Hi, you must be Jeff, she greeted. Jeff smiled wanly and confirmed that that was, in fact, who he was. Hello, I'm Sheila Woods. Nice to finally meet you in person, Jeff's mother announced, barging past her son and extending a hand to Randy's mother. Oh, Sheila, so pleased to meet you. I'm Bridget Hayden. Sorry to hear that our boys had a little mishap the other day. You know how it is, though, with teenagers. Hormones going crazy and all. 
Randy never gets into fights, but he explained to me that Jeff and his brother are still new to the area and haven't quite learned how we do things in Manderville yet. Isn't that right, Jeff? Jeff couldn't resist a small jab. Yes, I'm so sorry about that, Miss Hayden. Me and Lou had no idea it was okay for your son and his friends to take our bikes without asking. Bridget, he gets that mouth from his father. Never knows when to shut up. How about you and I go in and have some coffee, and you can tell me all the great gossip around Mandeville while our boys get to know each other the right way. Randy's in his room, Jeff, upstairs, second door to your left. I'm sure you'll hear the sound of his video games or something. Bridget stated with very little humor to her voice. Thank you, ma'am. Jeff answered and entered the house. Jeff knocked and heard Randy answer with, Come in! Hey, so, um... I guess you heard our parents want us to hang out? Get to know each other? Jeff stated with a little conviction. Yeah, it's my mom, all right. She doesn't like drama. Honestly, I think she worries too much. I mean, I'm cool if you're cool. Jeff sat down on the floor next to Randy and struck up a conversation. So, turns out your dad's my dad's boss? Freaked out about the fight in the parking lot. He was worried he'd get fired or something. My dad is everyone's boss, he said. I fucking hate it. I think half the kids at my school only talk to me because their parents are somehow connected to my dad's firm. Why do you hate that? Jeff asked. Because it's fake. The whole damn town, it's fake. You'll figure it out as you go, but trust me, everyone who lives here is just trying to pretend that there's something else. My parents make me do all this shit, all the trophies and stuff, just so they can brag. That's it. Jeff smiled. I know how you feel. My dad had me in boxing class a year ago because some co-worker of his had a brother that worked at the place. And as soon as that guy quit, I was out of that gym the next week. I wish it was that easy, Randy responded. I hate playing baseball, but my dad will sure have me out there again next summer. And the summer afterwards. It's like, he knows I hate it, but he wants to make sure that I'm out there with a stupid company name on the back of my jersey. Randy... Why did you and your friends fuck with our bikes the other day? I told you, this town's fake and boring as shit. There's nothing to do here. We have to find stuff to do. I mean, there are only so many times you can go hang out at the video store or ride the dirt paths in the woods. All the girls here are stuck up. All the stores close early. There's no mall and the movie theater's across town. We were just bored, man. So sorry for that, I guess. It's cool, Jeff replied. I guess I'm sorry, too. You know, things went too far. Oh, you mean the fight? Randy asked. That shit was actually cool. Those guys, Keith and Troy, they just leech on because of my dad. It's like I told you, I'm pretty sure their parents make them hang out with me. The afternoon went on, and Jeff soon forgot that this was a mandatory arrangement. He actually started to find himself liking Randy. Sure, their first encounter was a little sketchy, but he was coming around to the guy finding that he wasn't so bad once his idiot friends were removed from the equation. About an hour later, things took a new turn. Jeff heard the twin pops of two car doors shutting in near Unision, and then heard the engine start up. He dropped the game controller and peered out of Randy's bedroom window just in time to see his mother and Randy's mother backing out of the driveway. Our parents are leaving, Jeff said. Uh, about time. I figured my mom would eventually talk your mom into going shopping or going to get coffee or something like that. Jeff heard Randy pause the game. Hey, Jeff, come downstairs. I want to show you some cool stuff. Randy invited and Jeff followed. Randy led Jeff out to the garage. It was hot in here with the main door shut. The garage was well kept, though. And Jeff observed stacks of magazines underneath a workbench, as well as tools and various other utility items stacked about. Standing in the small closed-in garage with the late summer heat lingering about, Jeff began to feel a bit uneasy. Despite the fact that he and Randy had seemed to bond over the last few hours, Jeff couldn't ignore a sense that things were different now that the adults were gone. What did you want to show me? Jeff asked. Hold on, let me get it. Randy replied, moving the magazines out to reveal a small red box. Jeff watched as Randy removed the box and opened it. Check it out. My dad's flare gun. 
Brandy announced, and waved the red tubular gun about. Whoa, be careful with that, Jif shouted, more out of shock than real concern. It's fine, dude, don't be a pussy, it's not even loaded, Randy said. However, Jeff watched as he fished one of the flares out of a back compartment. Randy then continued to fiddle with the flare gun, popping it open and loading a flare. Now it's loaded, he said. You know, my dad showed me how to use this last year when we went out boating. Sometimes I take it out back and shoot flares at the trees, but... Maybe this time I don't need a tree. The change in Randy's voice and demeanor was impossible to ignore. Okay, well... Um... Cool gun. Let's get back in the house, though. I, it's hot out here. Plus, I'm getting hungry. Do you have anything to eat? However... As Jeff turned to walk through the small door leading back into the house, his path was suddenly blocked by two more familiar faces. Where are you going, Jeffrey? The fat kid Troy blurted out as he and Keith stepped forward into the garage. Took you two assholes long enough to get here. I've had to babysit this faggot all day, Randy shouted. A wicked joy was present in his words. Sorry, Randy, but Keith here had to mow his front yard before his parents would let him out, Troy said, a sheepish tone to his voice. That's fine, we're here now, Keith said. What the fuck's going on? Jeff asked dumbly, staring at Randy. He noticed that Randy still had the flare gun in his hands. I'll tell you what's going on, Jeff. You see, you owe Keith and Troy an apology for what you did. You sucker punched them and then ran away. Didn't even have the balls to fight them fair, so now you're going to pay them what you owe. I'm not going to fight you, okay? I'm done with that, Jeff replied as he glanced about the room for an exit. Oh, you're right. You're not going to fight. You're going to stand there and let my boys get their licks in. And then I get mine. And when that's done, you get the fuck out of my house. I'll tell my mom that you got sick and walked home, and after that, if you see us again, you better walk the other way. I'm not going to stand here and get hit by your friends, or you. So just let me go home. How about that? I'll tell my mom that we're cool and everyone wins, okay? Randy raised the flare gun towards Jeff. No. You stay. You stay. You get your licks. Jeff felt that sensation once more, that sick, rich, dark matter that swirled about inside of him. He could taste it now. It was heaven. In his mind, he imagined himself diving into it, swimming in it, letting it swallow him whole. He looked around, and the sensation only grew. He saw Randy, standing there, holding the flare gun. It was limp in his hands, though, and the hammer was not cocked back. Jeff knew that Randy had no intention of actually firing it. He looked over at Keith, skinny and pathetic, a kid born to follow. Troy, fat and sweaty, breathing a bit heavy from his walk over, and of course, in the middle of it all, Jeff himself. He felt that pleasure begin to mix with the rage, forming the perfect product. He tried to avoid sampling it. He knew that only regret could come from indulging in it. However... When it was placed so close, when the aroma and the promise of that sweet, savory flavor was only inches away, Jeff found that he could no more stand against it than a ship in the ocean could stand against a typhoon. Jeff began to smile. Why are you smiling at me? You queer or something? Randy asked, a slight nervous tinge in his voice. Oh, am I smiling, Randy? I guess it's just because I'm having so much fun, Jeff announced, and suddenly lunged towards the unprepared kid holding the flare gun. Jeff struck Randy once in the nose. Randy's arms dropped, yet he kept hold of the flare gun. Jeff, without even needing to look, realized that Troy and Keith had actually taken a step back, instead of advancing as they should have. Jeff delivered another strong blow to Randy's jaw, causing the boy to drop to the floor. Jeff now turned his attention to Troy and Keith, the two tough kids that had yet to actually make so much of a move in his direction. 
Troy actually backed up a step and stumbled over the stack of magazines that Randy had moved earlier. Jeff took this opportunity and stepped forward, once again introducing Troy's round belly to his fist. Troy attempted to stay on his feet, but Jeff's punches, combined with the stumble over the magazines, caused Troy to fall back, landing hard and striking his head on the concrete slab that was the garage's floor. Keith was actually trying to back away, however, Jeff was currently standing between him and the only exit to the garage, since the carport door was closed. Jeff took two quick steps towards the skinny kid, and felt the most intense joy at seeing Keith stagger backwards, knocking his back into the wall. That perfect blend of pleasure, control, and rage had come together. Jeff felt as though he was floating above the world. Somewhere in his mind, he knew that there would be hell to pay for this, but at that exact moment in time, he couldn't care less. He didn't care about Lou, he didn't care about being arrested, and he didn't care if his dad got fired. All he cared about in that fraction of time was hurting Keith. Keith tried to make a run for it, hoping to squeeze through the small gap between Jeff and the door. However, Jeff clipped him a hard right hand to his face, causing Keith to stagger back again. Jeff could see that his knees were buckling and took full advantage. He moved in, pinning Keith to the wall and began to deliver blow after blow to the skinny kid's stomach. Keith's eyes became as large as saucers. Once satisfied, Jeff stepped back and watched in demonic glee as Keith slowly slid down the wall, gasping for air. Randy got back to his feet, but seemed to have no idea what to do. We done now, Randy? We good. Or do you and your dumbass friends need more? Jeff mocked. No, 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 we're, we're, we're cool. How about you assholes? Jeff asked. It was Randy's idea, Keith said weakly. Y yeah, man, we didn't even want to, Troy agreed. The debate may have continued, but the sound of a returning car broke the tension. Ah, shit, my mom's back, Randy shouted, his voice cracking in a humorous way. It seemed that the previous tough guy had all but shrunk back to a scared child. So we'll, we'll just say that we were all hanging out, Keith replied. No, the fucking flare gun. If she sees it, then I'm screwed. So put it back, Jeff suggested. That sensation of rage was fading again, and he felt control returning. Yeah, grab the magazines, Randy begged. Jeff found that he rather liked that tone, that begging, whipped dog mentality. Jeff was paying no attention to Randy. He was down on the floor, calmly gathering the magazines. He didn't really care if Randy got in trouble or not. However, if his mother returned and found trouble, he feared that Lou may not be able to return home as promised. Everything else happened in a flash, both literally and figuratively. Randy, now in a panic over the trouble that he'd be in if he was caught playing with the flare gun, had begun to sweat. As his hands frantically clawed over the gun, his thumbs pushed the hammer back unintentionally. He didn't even notice that the gun was cocked. He was turning it over in his hands, trying to quickly disarm it. He then heard the sound of keys in the front door. He knew that he had only seconds now to hide it. Everything else happened in slow motion. The gun slipped from Randy's sweaty hands as he'd attempted to rotate it once more. He saw it fall to the floor, seeming to float to the ground rather than fall. Jeff, busy with stacking the magazines, had only enough time to register Randy's shocked gasps. He turned to look in the boy's direction just in time to see the bright red flare gun hit the floor. The gun discharged, launching a speeding ball of fire directly into Jeff's face. Jeff felt the hot flash of heat and pain tear across the left side of his face. After the initial registry of agony, there was no more thinking. Jeff began to scream, clutching the left side of his face and rolling around on the floor. For a while, he forgot everything as he was plunged into that dark, rich syrup once more, the rage almost serving to dull the pain. When he finally did come to a stable level of alertness, he realized he was in a hospital room, half of his face bandaged. He knew that much. He wanted to open his eyes and speak, let his family know he was awake, but the drugs still had a firm hold over him. He was awake, but not quite yet functioning. He could hear several familiar voices, though. Is he going to be okay, doctor? Jeff's mother asked. Oh, yes, ma'am. 
Your son will be fine, however, he will have a lengthy road to recovery, and will need your support. The flare struck his face and caused third-degree burns on his left side. How bad is the eye? Jeff's father asked. Hard to say at this point. He'll need to see an optometrist for further review, but the damage appears quite severe. And his face? What about his face? Jeff's mother asked, sounding deeply concerned. Well, we were able to clean and treat the injury in time, so you've no concern for infection or anything of that matter. We'll want him on antibiotics for a while, and he'll need to have the wound cleaned and dressed on a regular basis, but all in all, your son is very lucky. The damage could have been much more severe. Doctor, his mother began again, what if there's permanent damage? What do we do about that? As I said, an optometrist will have to examine the eye. Sheila Woods interrupted the doctor, sounding more agitated than before. You're not listening, not the eye. His face, what do we do to correct his face? She demanded. Oh, well, ma'am, we have treated his face. Like I said, there shouldn't be any risk of infection so long as you... Not the infection! His appearance. What can we do about that? Miss Woods, that is hardly a concern at this point. Once he is healed and back on his feet, you can possibly explore plastic surgery to repair some of the damage, but honestly, right now... We can't waste time concerned about how he looks. What is important is that your son is alive. He can expect to be home in a few days. Maybe sooner. Jeff's dad spoke again. Oh, okay. Thank you, doctor. Can we have some time alone, please? My wife and I need to speak. Certainly, the doctor replied. Lou, why don't you go down to the hospital cafeteria and get yourself a snack? Matt Wood suggested. But, but I want to be in here in case Jeff wakes up, Lou replied. Lou, they told us Jeff is heavily medicated. They don't expect him to wake up any time tonight. So just go, and if he does come around, we'll have you paged, Matt replied. Jeff heard the door open and close as Lou exited. His parents both let out a long, shaky sigh, but Jeff was starting to believe it was not a sigh of relief, but rather one of stress. We're going to have to homeschool him now, Matt. That's just going to be what it has to be. We're going to have to keep him home, he heard his mother rant, her voice sounding frantic. Uh, what? I mean, he probably won't be able to start school right away, but I doubt he'll miss an entire year, his father responded, trying to maintain a calmer voice. I'm not talking about that, Matt. I'm not worried about him missing a week or two of school. I mean, his face, Matt. You heard what the doctor said. His face, his face is going to be disfigured. Sheila argued back. Sheila, we don't even know the full extent of the damage yet. I mean, it could be minor. It could possibly heal. And you heard what he said. Plastic surgery could be an option in time. In time? In time. What kind of time? A year? Two years? What about in the meantime? People are going to see him. And they are going to talk. Is that what you want? He's going to be a pariah. You think anyone is going to want him around their kids? Jeff was hearing all of this, just letting it soak in. Slowly, as his mind absorbed the words, he felt that rage return, sick, rich, dark, that syrup of raw, primal emotion. He wanted to scream at his mother, to tell her to shut up! <laughs> that that he was the one lying there. Half his face burned, blind in one eye, all thanks to her, forcing him to go over to Randy's house. He wanted to ask her why she left, why she went off to go shopping or have her nails done. Whatever it was the cunt did. He wanted to know why she'd leave him alone with a child who just days before had tried to jump him and his brother. He wanted to know how she could care more about his appearance than the fact he was lying in the hospital. However, 
there was still so much more he wanted to know as well. He wanted to know how much more his mother hated him. How much more she saw him now as, as a, what, what, how did she put it? A pariah. He wanted to continue to swim in the thick pool of dark hatred that was starting to form from the rage and anger. That was a new one now. Before, it was anger, and then it was anger mixed with pleasure. But now... <laughs> now, it was anger mixed with hatred. And while he certainly longed to be free of it, well, he most certainly preferred the false sense of love and concern that believed he'd heard from her before. He also wanted to test it out just a bit more. He also began to wonder, how well would this new recipe blend with pleasure? How would it feel? Matt Woods began to speak again. I just can't believe he shot himself in the face with a flare gun. I always thought Jeff was more responsible than that. Oh, don't even get me started on that, Sheila replied. I couldn't believe it when Randy and his friends explained to the medics and police how it all happened. Randy was just trying to show Jeff around his house and wanted to show him the collection of magazines his dad kept. You know, boys, he was probably hoping a couple of playboys would be in there. And then he said that Jeff found the box containing the flare gun and just wouldn't stop playing around with it. You should have heard those other boys, Matt. They told me that they practically begged Jeff to just put it down before he got hurt, but he just had to show off. I just don't know where we went wrong, Matt. I thought us moving out here to a nice, quiet neighborhood would make everyone happy. Jeff, though, he just... He just wants to fight us on everything. And while all that came together in Jeff's mind, he continued to swim in that black ichor of hatred and rage. The morphine drip added a nice touch of euphoria. Jeff could almost see himself plunging into the syrupy waters of hatred and emerging changed. Each dip brought him so much twisted pleasure. And that was when he finally understood. He could sample the pleasure now, not because he was enjoying what was happening, but because he knew he could enjoy what was to come. Just as the doctor had predicted, Jeff was scheduled to go home a few days later. During his time at the hospital, he never asked to see his face. It wasn't until the last day that he finally asked for a mirror. The nurse had come in to change his bandages, as was the routine. She was a pleasant woman. She spoke to him, asked him how he was doing. He enjoyed her visits. So on the final day, when she arrived to clean and dress his face, he asked to see himself. Are you sure, sweetheart? Would you like me to call in your parents first? She asked. No, thank you, Jeff replied. I think I want to see it for myself first without them standing over me. I understand, she replied honestly, without a hint of pretension. Once the bandages were off, she handed him a small hand mirror. Would you like me to step out of the room? She asked. Jeff ignored her, then looked at himself, taking stock of the damages. Sure enough, his face was a mess, the entire left side at least. The flare struck him, traveling upwards, and burned a scar into his left cheek that extended to his eye. At first glance, it almost appeared that he was smiling on that side. The scar was still bright red, and burn tissue spread out on either side. Once it arrived at his eye, the news did not get any better. His eye was white, just a lifeless bowl plugged into his face. He closed his right eye and found that he could see nothing from his left eye at all. The scar continued up the left side of his forehead. The damage was less severe there, however. The hair on the left side of his head was burned off, leaving a few strands to stick up here and there. Sorry, sweetie, but I have to put the bandages back on, she told him. Jeff smiled. That's okay. There will be plenty of time for me to admire it later. There was no joy from his parents on the ride home, or upon arrival. They spoke very little, and there was a tension in the car that simply would not fade. 
As for Lou, he was thrilled that his brother was okay, but he didn't know what to say concerning the damage to his face, so after asking a few questions about the accident and the recovery, he fell silent as well. They walked into their home at dusk, and Lou asked about dinner. He suggested they let Jeff pick a place to celebrate his return home. Just go to sleep, both of you boys. Go to sleep. Sheila and her husband both retreated to their bedrooms as well, to argue or feel sorry for themselves, who knew. Jeff and Lou did not speak that night. Jeff spent much of the evening staring at himself in the mirror. He kept pulling back the bandages and looking at the scars. Lou wanted to see them too, but felt that it might be imprudent to ask. I'm glad you're home, Jeff. I really missed you, and I'm glad you're okay, Lou said to Jeff as he stared at himself. <laughs> I'm not okay, Lou. Neither are you. None of us are. Really. There's a sickness here. The only difference is now my sickness shows on the outside. Jeff replied, his voice eerie and low. What are you talking about? Lou asked. One day, you'll see it too. This is what happens, though. This is what happens when it all falls down. Jeff said, still peeking behind his bandages. Jeff, I don't know what you're trying to say. Jeff didn't reply, though, and after several moments... Lou left him be. Lou went down to his parents' bedroom and knocked on the door. What is it? The voice of his mother asked. Mom, I think Jeff is acting weird. You may want to come talk to him. Go away, Lou. Leave your mother alone. His father's voice answered. Lou, being young, had no other ideas, so he returned to his own bedroom. He didn't know that those would be the last words he'd ever hear his parents speak to him. That night, Sheila and Matt Woods awoke together, both being light sleepers. It took little to bring them out of slumber. The sudden removal of their blanket, as it was snatched from the bed, did the trick just fine. They awoke to see a small light coming from the half-bath that was situated in their master bedroom. The door was cracked only slightly, and the light source was weak. They could make out a human shape standing over their bed, though. What? What's going on? Sheila grumbled. As their vision came into focus, they realized their son was standing before them. Matt reached over and flipped on the lamp next to their bed. Jeff was standing there, his bandages off, disfigured face beaming down on them. With a long kitchen knife clutched in his right hand. What are you doing, son? Matt asked, his mind still trying to shake out the cobwebs of sleep. He's got a knife! Sheila screamed, grabbing at her husband's arm. Matt kept his composure, though. Sheila, it's probably the painkillers. He likely got up and got disoriented. Relax, for Christ's sake! Jeff tilted his head to one side, still not speaking. He stared hard at his father, slowly bringing the knife up ensuring that he saw it well. Son, what are you doing? Matt asked. Scaring you. Jeff replied. Matt, do something! Sheila pleaded. Okay, son. I realize that you've been through a lot, but you need to go back to sleep. I'm going to call the doctor in the morning and... Jeff moved quickly across his father's side of the bed, his head moving about, alternating between a normal-looking young man and the deformed ghoul that had been lurking in the shadows. Okay, son. 
You scared me. Is that what you wanted? Matt asked, adjusting to the middle of the bed to put distance between himself and his son. <laughs> Good. Now I can start hurting you. Jeff spoke again. He lunged onto the bed, driving the knife into his father's stomach. Matt attempted to fend Jeff off, but the wound to his midsection mm -hmm. rendered him into shock, and his arms fell to the side. Jeff could hear his mother screaming, but paid her no mind. He wanted to finish his father first. Removing the knife, Jeff stabbed down into his stomach three more times in quick succession. His father gasped and coughed up blood, his body jerking and twitching each time the knife found its mark. After the third time, Matt Woods lay still. Sheila had backed up against the headboard of the bed. She wanted to climb down, make a run for it, but she balled herself up between the headboard and the end table. In her frantic state of terror and confusion, she couldn't figure out how to do anything as simple as dismount a bed. Jeff, why? Why are you doing this? She asked feebly. Randy started it. <laughs> you must have known that, but you ignored it. Lou had a busted lip. You must have seen that. But you ignored it. <laughs> I was shot in the face! With a flare gun. You believed Randy? Why? Was it so you could fit in? Jeff asked in a low, almost growling voice. No, baby, I believed you. It was just your father's job, and we're new here. Oh, God, Jeff, please. Tell me more about homeschool, Mom. <laughs> Tell me about how you don't want to send me out in public because of my face, Mom. Tell me how none of the other children will want to be my friend. Now none of their parents will want to be yours. Tell me about that, Mom. Tell me. Tell me, tell me, tell me, tell me, tell me, tell me, tell me. How nice it's gonna be. You homeschooling me. Jeff, please, I was just stressed. I was worried about you, and that's... That's all I... Hmm. Oh, Mom... I think you should take your own advice, you know? What you told Lou when we got home tonight. He wanted to do something nice. Something to welcome me home, and... Do you remember what you told us to do instead? Jeff asked as he now crawled over cornering his mother on the bed. What did I say? She asked, the question coming out barely a whisper. Go to sleep. Jeff drove the knife into his mother's chest. He stabbed her over and over again, and as he did, he finally found that perfect recipe that heavenly blend, that rage, hate, and pleasure all mixed into one perfect formula, and for a while, Jeff became lost in it. Jeff opened his brother's bedroom door, not surprised to find his brother asleep. He had dozed off with headphones in, so he slept through all the shouting. That was fine with Jeff. It was easier that Lou not have to hear all of that. Jeff sat down on his brother's bed and nudged him slightly. It took a moment, but Lou finally opened his eyes and looked up. Jeff removed his earphones for him. You're free now, Lou. He spoke softly. Jeff, what... What are you talking about? Lou mumbled, still half asleep. He'll... He'll see in the morning. I just... Wanted to let you know... That I love you. You've been my best friend. Remember that, okay? 
Thanks. I, I love you too. Just let me go back to sleep. Lou replied, already dozing off again. Jeff smiled and stood up. As he left the room, he looked back at his sleeping brother one last time before he vanished into the night.